me get into the mood here and get you in the mood a little bit with a few little examples. Coordination. One of the great C words like contrariety and creativity and consciousness and complexity and conflict and cooperation. And Luciano Pavarotti. This is quite incredible, yes? A horse on a treadmill. Coordination is such a word that it's, we're so used to it, it's, it's like gravity, we take it for granted. But it is an amazing feature of living things. And that happens to be my, my grandson at three months. This one. I tell her, where's that this one from? This is actually a study we did of Lipizzan or horses. And you can analyze the motions of them very nicely. This is incredible. As Emmanuel uh, said very nicely in her introduction, uh, the word coordination is uh, emerging. Uh, this is from Nature Review's Neuroscience in February of this year, 2010. And uh, those are the four editors of Nature Review's Neuroscience. They look collectively to average about 25 years old. Maybe less than a century between them, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is the key thing. In order to maintain proper brain function, neural activity often needs to be tightly coordinated within neuronal ensembles and across different brain regions. And in this issue, three, ish three articles highlight new concepts that help to explain the functional importance of this coordination and how it's achieved. And as Emmanuel also noted, a coordination is, uh, I think you would have, Two years ago, you'd have heard the word synchronization rather than coordination. And coordination actually is a little messier than synchronization, although I believe synchronization, it's a kind of primitive form of self-organization. Uh, it's a very good place to start, because at least we know what we're talking about. So how does the enormous society of cells talking to each other give rise to our thoughts, our emotions, our movements, and even consciousness itself? Uh, I, uh, so let's just get into the idea of coordination. Let me take the last word on my slide, which had to do with complementarity. And I'm struck again and again why we always talk about two views of brain function, or two views of anything. And these are just some of the dichotomies that uh, our brains, our minds, seem to always like to uh, create. So you may think, oh no, it, it's not nature versus nurture, it's not genotype versus phenotype, but I would invite you to pick up any typical scientific journal and you will certainly see it presented as an either or. So we live in a world of either or, and the last part of my uh, talk is aimed at actually getting us to the notion of neither nor. So we can assume the either or, uh, that will be part of this, but the last part will be both and, and neither nor. And that's where the complementarity comes in. And the chimera you'll see will emerge as a, uh, as a motivator for that. So, uh, for example, at the meeting, as I mentioned last night, that we held uh, two or three weeks ago, one of the big debates was, is the brain a reflexive organ, or does it have a great deal of intrinsic dynamics? And uh, uh, Mark Rakel gave a lovely talk on that. But we're very used to you know, the great problem of Western society is the individual more important than the collective. 
Uh, the two great theories of brain function have to do with integration and segregation. If you pick up papers on the connectome, you will see that is the brain integrated? Is it segregated and specialized? So we, we play this game all the time. Uh, if you listen to talks, is it top down or bottom up? And I'm going to suggest to you that as far as understanding is concerned, we need to see these aspects as deeply complementary uh, and take them uh, seriously. Uh, I leave you with this. Uh, this is Wolfgang uh, Pauli, uh, the great physicist known as the living conscience of theoretical physics, the exclusion principle, of course, the Pauli effect, which most of you will know. Every time he walked into a laboratory, the apparatus broke down. He even was visiting Berlin one time and uh, the experiment broke even though he was just in the railway station. Yeah. So, uh, Pauli, of course, uh, uh, had a relationship with Carl Jung, uh, and to us the only acceptable point of view appears to be one that recognizes both sides of reality, the quantitative and the qualitative, the physical and the psychical, as compatible with each other, and can embrace them simultaneously. So can we get to that place where we are not back into this, the, the old, tired Cartesian dualism, the Popperian strategy for uh, understanding complex systems, I believe, will be limited. So, this problem of coordination in nature reminded me of a lovely phrase that, of Howard Patisse, a, 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 an eminent theoretical biologist who worried about these things. I do not see any way to avoid the problem of coordination and still understand the physical basis of life. Think about it. At every level, every conceivable level, you see this coordination. It's like gravity, we take it for granted. Uh, a friend of mine said, well, is coordination just an interaction? No, it's more than an interaction. It's a kind of functional order in space and time. It's not the usual kind of stuff you see in physics. Uh, what's the nature of this ordering? How many different kinds of coordination are there? What forms do they take? How do they evolve in time? Seen on many levels and many different kinds of systems. How do we understand coordination in the brain? If I went around you all and asked you, what do you mean by understanding? Put your metaphysics out front here. It would be a very interesting exercise. Maybe we do that this afternoon. <laughs> um, how do we understand coordination in the brain? Are there general laws or principles? What would they look like? What language and vocabulary might we even use to express them? What kind of thing is the brain that it should be coordinated at every conceivable level? Yeah. What kind of thing is the brain that it could be coordinated at every conceivable level? Well, let me present to you what I take to be the two elements. In a book I wrote called Dynamic Patterns some years ago, I talked about the two Turings, Alan Turing of the computer, uh, the Turing uh, computer architecture, and the Turing of the uh, uh, chemical basis of morphogenesis. Uh, two very different views of nature. Uh, Edelman, if you read his early works, uh, I mean, this guy uh, did a lot of work on neural cell adhesion molecules. Anatomy was the royal road to function. Uh, this is a paper with uh, Joe Galley uh, that deals with degeneracy. Okay, and then I'm going to take a, a sort of a, a provocative stance here for you because, uh, as we were talking last night, the role of mechanism and the search for mechanism is a dominant aspect of biology. But degeneracy means the ability of structurally different elements to perform the same uh, biological function or yield the same output, depending on the context. Uh, I won't go into the technical differences with redundancy. For all intents and purposes, let's assume they're the same. But degeneracy is both a prerequisite for and an inescapable product the process of natural selection. There you see the yin-yang uh, complementarity aspect already there. Uh, is it really true? Well, every level you study in biology, from the genetic code through protein folding, through gene control, through metabolism. Metabolism is a very interesting situation, right? Enormous variety of diets are nutritionally equivalent. Cells within tissue, no differentiated cell is uniquely indispensable. Intra and intracellular signaling, 
uh, parallel and converging uh, pathways of various hormones and so on. It's just a list. Development can often occur normally in the absence of usual cells, substrate signaling molecules. We were talking about Wilson and Tonagawa last night. They removed do a, a complete uh, uh, a gene knockout of NMDA, and they even use mice to do uh, water mazes, which is also a ridiculous kind of idea because mice aren't really used to negotiating water. <laughs> They're very good with nests, but. Uh, uh, you know, this thing learns the water maze just, you know, with a slight delay. No NMDA at all. Connectivity in neural networks, enormous degeneracy, synaptic plasticity, sensory modalities, body movements, my favorite, of course. I can touch this this way, this way, this way. I can configure my actions in multiple ways to achieve the same outcome. Many, many different mechanisms involved. Many, many different parts of the brain involved differentially, yet the same outcome can be achieved. And I would like us to confront this, because this doesn't look too good for a straight engineering attitude. Behavioral repertoires, social communication, many ways to transmit the same message. Two, victory, you know, uh, five, whatever, two beers. Up you, whatever. Sure. Well, uh, just a couple of examples. I'm not going to dwell very uh, long in these. Uh, these are some studies we did some years ago uh, of uh, Florida Atlantic University football players. Uh, and the idea was to image them before they had the concussion because we knew they were going to get knocked around. Florida Atlantic University is not much good at football compared to the Gators, the University of Florida Gators. And so these are just some examples that uh, in mental subtraction tasks. So, so we brought them in before uh, uh, they went out to the field. And then uh, of the 10 that we selected, four of them got concussions. These are their brains after the concussion doing the mental subtraction task. They do it just as well as normal. They can go back to the field. But you can see uh, enormous differences between their brains, both in terms of levels of activations in terms of which activations, where they are, and so on. Highly degenerate. Uh, without concussion, after concussion, doing finger sequencing, and so on. Yeah. Degeneracy uh, is seen at every observable level of description. The same outcome, and I would like to call this the principle of functional equivalence, uh, so that uh, Form will follow function in this picture. And I'd like to sort of say that this is oh, oh, fundamental. Yeah. So uh, the concept that, uh, and the, or the thing that I would like to push uh, here or present to you is that uh, all this is telling us is that the system is highly synergized. And the synergy is, I think, a very basic functional unit of living things at all levels. It's defined as a functional grouping of structural elements temporarily assembled. And we hear words like transiently linked in discussions that followed uh, to act in a coherent unitary fashion. Very like, actually, some definitions of cell assembly. You know? So uh, the thing is that we know about these uh, synergies. They're really quite remarkable. Uh, experiments years ago, done at Yale, Haskins Laboratories, 25 years ago, had a speaker. Yeah? And the speaker was asked to produce a bab. It's a bab again. And suddenly the jaw was halted. Normally the jaw and the lower lips right together. You halt the jaw suddenly. The first articulator that comes into play 30 milliseconds after the jaw perturbation is the uh, upper lip. Okay? So within 30 milliseconds, the upper lip is now traveling faster so that it can reach the point of closure to produce the acoustic output. You say, is that a mechanical kind of reaction? Is it like a Sherentonian reflex kind of thing? Well, no, it isn't. Just change the context and say, baz, it's a baz again, as in the first syllable of the well-known word. It's a baz again, baz, yeah. Tuck, pull the jaw again, 
What's the first articulator that responds to the jaw perturbation? Normally you see the jaw and the tongue ride together when you have to produce the alveolar fricative at the top of the mouth. Now, you take the jaw out of the system with a brief perturbation, the first thing that happens is the genial glossus muscles activate within about 25 milliseconds to take the tongue to the roof of the mouth to produce the fricative sound. So the synergy here is uh, functionally specific to the sound that's produced. Yeah? And it's exquisitely sensitive. It's as if every member of the synergy, every member of the grouping was potentiated such that normal variation or an experimental perturbation is responded to by other functionally related members of the synergy. Get it? Yeah. So the idea, for example, for, for our problem of coordination, that there may be uh, brain synergies, is an idea that I think can be uh, neatly tested. So degeneracy and synergy are two sides of the same coin. Remember, degeneracy uh, is uh, thought to be a product and uh, a process involved in natural selection. Synergies, uh, no, I don't think so. Synergies, we think, are self-organized. So we, this is one of the dualities we have to kind of reconcile, namely nat natural selection and self-organization. Well, are they really uh, uh, synergies really self-organized? Where do synergies come from? Might say, oh, they're developed or learned or something like that, but that doesn't get to the core of it. What's the basis of synergies? How do they form? How do they change? And uh, uh, the key notion here is that synergies are actually self-organized. So uh, a colleague, friend, uh, Carl Friston, has been writing a lot, nearly every journal you pick up, in fact, <laughs> uh, about his free energy principle. The free energy principle says that any self-organizing system, the brain, that is, at equilibrium with its environment, must minimize its free energy. That's Carl's principle. But actually, I would ask the question, is the brain self-organized, and how would you know? How would you know? You can't assume that the brain is self-organized. Yeah? How would you know? So to do that, you have to do experiments. Now, let's do an experiment. Experiments are the scapegoat of speculation. The experiments, however, need to be done with a different eye in mind. That is to say, uh, it's not going to be the usual experiment where you decide on some task and you manipulate an independent variable and study uh, uh, some dependent variable, brain activity, behavior, cognition, reaction time, the whole uh, caboodle. Uh, these experiments are actually going to uh, talk about qualitative change and uh, why qualitative change is important. Uh, the idea is that we're going to try to identify what the relevant variables are for synergies, for coordinated systems. And we don't know those a priori. Because the question that we need to ask ourselves at this meeting, uh, what really are the key variables? Qualitative change doesn't mean, you know, bad quantitative. Qualitative change, in this sense, is in uh, the, 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 within the concept of uh, phase transitions in physics, where there's a qualitative change from water to ice and so on, liquid to ice and so on. So qualitative change, as you'll see, has real quantitative consequences. <coughs> and the idea is that uh, uh, qualitative change allows us to see one pattern of coordination relative to another. Many things can be changing, but the quantities that change qualitatively are the ones that matter, uh, informationally matter for the system. And near these critical points where things change, the essential process is governing pattern stability, flexibility, and selection can be uncovered. And you'll hear, I think, uh, a lot in uh, the, the days that follow and following this talk with uh, Dietmar and, and Dante, uh, I think you'll see discussions of uh, criticality and one over F alpha distributions and so on that suggest this kind of thing. This is a very simple experiment. It's uh, Tuesday morning, that conference on the sea. Uh, it's, it's like a little experiment that you might do with a musician. And I, I always, uh, I'm amazed at how good people are at synchronizing to external events and what that means. This is not a reactive system. So you have a metronome, 
and you're asked to produce a hand movement in coordination with the metronome. And you can see here, uh, this is just an, uh, an illustration, that the phase relation between the hand and the metronome is around zero. And actually, you can increase the speed of the metronome, but people can do that. They can maintain that temporal relationship. Just uh, do something slightly different and ask the person not to synchronize with the metronome, but to syncopate with the metronome. And then you see, again, the relative phase now is 180 degrees, the phase relation between the, the leaps of the metronome and the hand movement now are 180 degrees. And if you increase the speed now, you'll see at a certain point a sudden transition uh, from the syncopated to the synchronized. And notice uh, there's a fluctuational structure here prior to this transition. Yeah. So uh, you can see that in data. Uh, here's a representation of the data, the metronome, the hand movement, you actually measure the trajectories. Uh, here's your control parameter that you're manipulating. It's a control parameter in the sense that it moves the system through coordinated states of affairs. You're looking at the relative phase. Uh, 0, 360, 720 are identical. You can see that uh, when the system is uh, uh, antiphase, it's, uh, it, it can keep antiphase very well. This would be the synchronized case. And at a certain point, the, the fluctuations grow and the system switches. Now, uh, these are just some performance measures. Here's the required frequency, the performed frequency. People are very good at that. Uh, here's the relative phase for synchronization, syncopation. People are very good at that. The key thing I want you to note, because you're going to see some brain uh, information here shortly, is that the standard deviation of the synchronization hardly changes as a function of the rate. But you already see that the standard deviation, which is a measure of stability, variability is a measure of stability, a dynamic measure of stability, you see that the variability grows as the parameter changes. And you could already see, right, that uh, the variability is going to grow until the system switches. And when the system switches, it will come back down to uh, lower levels of variation. Now, uh, I think this is, a, this is a, a relatively recent paper last year, December last year, where we're looking at uh, functional magnetic resonance images and the very interesting thing here is that you see the uh, fMRI, the bold amplitudes for synchronization and for syncopation. And you see that the bold signal is traveling with the variability of behavior. It tracks it almost perfectly. Yeah? Yeah? And uh, there seems to be a stability-dependent network that is independent of what you actually are coordinating. So it doesn't matter if you're coordinating vision with movement or sound with movement. It doesn't even matter if you're coordinating in your mind. Coordinating, not thinking about movement, but thinking about a coordination pattern. You see this stability-dependent network. And in fact, why you know stability is running the show, uh, and you can quantify this stability-dependent uh, network, for example, with structural equation modeling, and so on. Uh, why uh, you know that stability is running the show? Because uh, whereas uh, these experiments were on spontaneous transitions, they happen spontaneously. That's the self-organizing aspect. Uh, uh, when you ask the subject to intentionally switch from more stable to less stable, or from less stable to more stable, actually, there are real consequences of that. So you're able to switch much faster from uh, less stable to more stable. That's because you're already intrinsically unstable. But when you have to switch the other way at a given rate, go from a more stable to a less stable pattern, you actually see great increases in activity in the basal ganglia, putamen, and so on. So stability here is uh, playing, our variability, if you like, is playing a key role. Let's move on to the dynamics a little bit. You know, over the course of the next few days, a lot of work on uh, 
MEG and EEG and so on. Uh, this just shows you the system and in polar projection. So coming out of the head would be the magnetic field entering into blue, out in red. With the right-hand rule, you could identify uh, a source in there and so on, the orientation of the source. Uh, just to kind of show you the intrinsic dynamics of the brain here, before the person makes the movement, the dynamics here. So this is kind of uh, slowed down because these data are being sampled once every millisecond. But you see kind of the weather of the brain, as it were, and then you see uh, a dipolar-like structure emerge. Um, just show it again, which happens to be the finger movement, because the people are making right-hand finger movements. And these are a series of conditions here. And I want you, uh, like you would be extending on the beat or flexing on the beat, that uh, uh, you can actually analyze these uh, pattern dynamics and connect them to the actual behavior of the person. What is MEG? What is it? This is MEG. MEG, yeah. So these are magnetic fields generated intracellular dendritic currents uh, generate this field. You can pick them up from the outside and so on, yeah? Uh, one uh, millisecond resolution. So just, you know, that actually if you cast the data into the appropriate frame of reference, you can actually see a very clear connection, in the case of movement at least, of the time-dependent amplitude of these spatial patterns and the uh, trajectory of the movement, specifically the velocity of the movement. Uh, so if you want to get your hand to the right place at the right time, if you're synchronizing with an external event, if you're dancing with someone, uh, uh, it looks as if the brain is uh, generating signals that uh, are extremely sensitive to the velocity. Just to show you that again, these are four different, entirely different conditions, but showing you the same kind of thing. Now, uh, Yan Ching Chen uh, uh, did some very nice work where he looked at uh, uh, higher order rhythms in the brain, in this case the beta, but also alpha and gamma, and he was able to connect different rhythms to specific parts of this behavior. This is just one example where there's a very nice demarcation between extension on the beat and flexion on the beat, which are pretty much the same, and extension off the beat and flexion off the beat. Uh, so uh, it looks as if uh, you can use these kinds of techniques to demarcate different conditions very nicely here in the beta range. And this is old work, but when you do a Fourier transform of these signals and calculate then the relative phase from the Fourier transform, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 in Roman capitals are the uh, uh, values of the control parameters. So again, you're going faster as you go along here. And uh, I, I even forget, so uh, these are 10 cycles and then the parameter changes. You go a little bit faster, go a little bit faster. And of course you see the transition. One of these uh, squares corresponds to the behavior, the other corresponds to the brain. And you can see very nicely actually the signature features of self-organization, which the basic feature has to do with the, this being a non-equilibrium phase transition. So you see that every time the parameter change, it perturbs the system a little bit, and the system comes back. It perturbs the, again, the system again, it takes longer and longer to come back, and then it kicks, switches gears. So you see two signatures, experimental signatures, of the theory of uh, non-equilibrium phase transitions. Namely, you see enhancement of fluctuations prior to the transition, and you see uh, what's called critical slowing down. The system gets slower as it approaches the transition. Yeah? So it takes longer and longer to get back to where it was, the nearer it approaches the transition. Yeah? So you see this very nice mapping also, once again, between behavior and uh, brain activity. Now, uh, I like this. Uh, this is Francis Crick, of course. And uh, 
probably later on we'll hear Susan talk about consciousness and so on, but uh, uh, and the various neural correlates uh, uh, of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, this is an old paper, 79. What's that, 30 odd years ago? Uh, his remarks about consciousness don't concern me at this point too much, but I think this uh, statement actually is very interesting. If a breakthrough in the study of the brain does come, it's perhaps likely to be at the overall control of the system to invent a possible, although unlikely, example. The discovery that the brain was run phasically would probably constitute a major breakthrough. Now, Crick's astonishing hypothesis, his book, Astonishing Hypothesis, probably left a lot of people cold. But I think this statement actually uh, it may be quite prescient. It may actually be quite relevant. And Crick may be uh, closer to the mark than he or anybody else realized with the idea of the brain uh, being run physically. And you just saw, just uh, a minute ago, examples of non the brain face transitions. It wasn't so very long ago. This is Science Magazine, and this is your gray singer uh, effect that everybody knows between local field potentials and single units, that uh, a coordination effect, you can see it's coordinated roughly around 40 times a second, 40 hertz. Timeline is 200 milliseconds. There's about, I don't know, five, uh, no, eight. So it's about 40 hertz. This is the gamma, famous gamma frequency. But everybody got so excited that with a coordination uh, effect in neuroscience that uh, this was the mind revealed. Uh, I just want to show you some examples. Now, where I'm going is just to show you examples that the coordination is a little bit messier than this. I've shown you transitions. You've seen synchronization. I'm just pulling out some examples. Here's some examples of two brains interacting just to show you the phenomena, and uh, this is a famous uh, Tognoli et al. experiment where you have uh, two people, you're recording from two brains, and initially they're asked to just produce their uh, <coughs> hand movements up and down at their own preferred frequency and amplitude. And then uh, uh, suddenly uh, they're allowed to see each other's hands after 20 seconds. So this means they're going to be, in principle, visually coupled. And then it goes off again. The light goes off again. Right? So uh, what you see here are the two people. Well, you'll see uh, the kinds of things they do. Um, so there's the screen is open. Uh, they, don't, they don't see each other's uh, finger. Then uh, the opacity uh, becomes transparent. They do and uh, they coordinate. So there's 20 seconds of independent behavior. They, they're just doing their own thing. 20 seconds where they just see each other's hand, and 20 seconds again where they go back to doing their own thing, which actually turns out to be interesting because there's a kind of a memory of the effect. So this is the setup. I want to just show you the examples here uh, because this characterization will be important when we talk uh, theoretically. Uh, in red and blue are the frequencies of the hand movements that people adopt. So you can see that they're quite different here in this case. And uh, so this is the first 20 seconds where they're independent. Here they see each other in the middle, and here they don't at the end again. But you can see actually this pair uh, are doing their own thing. This is the relative phase between the two uh, hand movements. And you can see the phase just wraps. This is a signature that this is an uncoordinated system. What was and the task? Sorry. sorry. What was the task? Oh, again, um, they uh, initially are brought into the laboratory. They move their hand movements. They're told to do, make hand movements as if they're going to do it all day. Uh, and they're just going along at 20 seconds. They choose their own preferred frequency and amplitude. And then they're allowed to see each other's hand for 20 seconds. Yeah? And then, uh, again, after 20 seconds, they, uh, they're prevented from seeing each other again. 
Get it? So it's a continuous task. That would be one trial. Yeah, there's not an instruction, just see it. There, this is totally spontaneous. Actually, uh, maybe we tell you later uh, uh, that we have done experiments where you intentionally coordinate and so on. But this is, I, I'm trying to, to, to show you some signatures of so-called self-organization that cut across, in this case, two brains, two people um, coordinating with each other. So um, let me see if I, yeah, so here's one where they're initially uncoordinated, wrapping, but when they see each other, they coordinate in phase with each other. They synchronize in phase, and then after the uh, lights uh, uh, go off again, uh, they go back to a uh, uh, uncoordinated state of affairs, but it's quite interesting because there's a kind of remnant of uh, the coordination. Here's a, sim a similar case where once they see each other, this pair coordinate antiphase. Uh, here's a case where they're initially uncoordinated. The frequencies are well separated. When they see each other, the frequencies come closer together. And you see this kind of hold release dynamic. Yeah? So you see a tendency to coordinate. Uh, the, this tendency to escape means that the components are going to do their own thing. So this is a very interesting kind of transient uh, phase locking. And you can get continuation effects as well. This is just to illustrate the uh, range of coordination uh, effects. And of course, you can find these. Then this is a, a wavelet transform of the brain signal. And uh, here it is in roughly in the 10 hertz region. We call this the phi rhythm. I won't go into all the details of this. Uh, the phi rhythm is located over uh, right parietal uh, regions of the brain. Uh, and it seems to be very sensitive to whether the people are coordinating with each other or not. But again, uh, just the phenomena here, and then we show you the theory. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a, the famous Varela paper, and it's probably more a caricature. I think Jean-Philippe, I once asked you about this once. Uh, but because uh, uh, you're a co-author of this paper. But uh, here are the raw signals. They bandpass, filter them. Again, just to show you the signal processing aspect. Here's the instantaneous phase difference, the Hilbert phase. And the, here's what you see, you see. You see initially, in this particular uh, set of data, that uh, the, the phase difference is jumping around, and then it just becomes transiently coupled, then jumps around, becomes transiently coupled, and so on. So you see the same kind of dynamic here uh, at the level of brain. Now, the tendency would be to say, well, that's noisy, and this is coherent. So I studied this. This is noisy, this is coherent. But what I want to show you, actually, is you need to look at the whole picture. And when you do, this is actually a very, very interesting and important regime for uh, the brain. So let's see. And uh, just, uh, uh, I think this is from a kind of a, a editorial, again, uh, of an article in Science. but. Uh, people have identified different uh, uh, oscillations in different parts of the brain, prefrontal parietal cortex. There's a network there. Uh, there are effects on other parts of the brain that seem to come in at different frequencies. Right? So it's not just this sort of phase attraction effect uh, or with slightly different frequencies. You can get coupling of frequencies and again the meeting will be, there'll be uh, people talking about cross-frequency coupling. And, of course, you know, there's a whole array of these rhythms. And this is just to kind of uh, give you a picture of these. These are Greek alphabetic characters. Uh, they have uh, apparently functional significance for all kinds of things. Um, so... The basic language here of the brain, at least dynamically, uh, seems to be in oscillations. And uh, this is actually some old work we did, uh, Gonzalo de Guzman, who's here. But this is a way to uh, understand mathematically how these frequency relations would link to each other, what cross-frequency coupling would mean. These structures here correspond to what are called Arnold tongues. You have a coupling coefficient here, 
and you have the frequency ratio here, and you can see the reason you would see, for example, a 2 to 1 a frequency ratio is that this is a very stable region. It's wide, and it's stable uh, as a function of the coupling strength. Whereas others, for example, 2 to 5 is much narrower. So if you had, uh, what would be two to, uh, 2 to 5 in the brain? I don't, you know, we could do some calculations, 3 to 5 and so on. 2 to 3 is a little bit broader. But you see already that this uh, uh, theoretical picture would give you, 1 to 1, of course, is large, very large stability regions. So this is telling you why you would see some frequency ratios more frequently than others. Of course, you still have to attach the functional uh, significance uh, uh, of, of these things. But this would give you the kind of mathematical picture. And it would tell you, for example, why people find some musical rhythms easier than others, and so on and so forth. Uh, some uh, uh, frequencies in the brain are going to be more easily coupled than others. But let me simplify the story for uh, purposes of uh, explanation here, and just to ask the question here, what have we got? What do we want to understand here? And what we got are uh, coordinated phase and frequency locked states. Uh, neuroscientists give these their own names, functional integration, binding, dynamic linking. We see no coordination where there's independence of populations, independence of activities. And we see transitions, you know, you could envisage these spontaneous transitions as basically uh, a form of decision making. You go from two possibilities, bistability to monostability, or in general, from multistability to monostability. This is a decision making mechanism, and it's under environmental or parametric control. It's kind of dynamic decision making. And you see then this uh, uh, other key aspect of partial coordination where there are transient tendencies for the parts to couple together with tendencies for the components to remain independent. And people have done sort of stationary measures of this kind of thing, like uh, uh, Giulio Tononi and Olaf Sporns, and refer to it really as uh, neural complexity. But we're talking about dynamical systems here that don't have necessarily stationary probability distributions and so on. So how do we explain this entire plethora of phenomena? Well, I don't know if I have really time except to give you a very brief idea here. The whole idea behind self-organization is that you have an extremely high dimensional system with very many measurements that lives in lower dimensional subspaces or a, a, a manifold, we call that, yeah? a lower dimensional manifold. Yeah? And you'll see some of this manifold dynamics, for example, tomorrow when Misha talks, uh, where uh, they've uh, done some very nice models of that, which is a little bit tricky. But I, I, I want to, you to get the idea here of very high dimensionality under certain conditions. The entire system lives in lower dimensional spaces. And I give you the sheepdog as an example of that. So the sheepdog, the, there are very many, if you like, the sheep are microscopic degrees of freedom. Yeah, many degrees of freedom. And uh, of course they have, these components have tendencies and inherited tendencies and so on. But what the sheepdog is trying to do in a two-dimensional space is bring this entire array of elements into a controllable system. It's bringing it into its own two-dimensional system. So you see an enormous compression of information here. Uh, that the sheepdog now can control the entire ensemble, entire synergy, as really as one thing, not as many things. Yeah? And these, uh, this is a, an example of what are called structured flows of manifolds. Uh, years ago we called that task dynamics. Uh, so that uh, you're seeing uh, very high dimensions compressed into a lower dimensional manifold that you have to uh, articulate, of course, and of course that manifold can have dynamics. But the point is, you, you're away from just state descriptions here, you're talking about manifold dynamics. And this, uh, I can't resist showing you this because uh, this appeared in science a little while ago where uh, people were studying um, the riding styles of uh, jockeys and horses. Actually, we'd, we'd studied liposanners with real 
experimental measures on, on this, but the key thing is this is a very complex system. Yeah? <coughs> Animal-human coordination. Uh, but uh, when you actually look at the measurements, and here they're looking at the cranial caudal measurements, front to back, horizontal motion, relative to uh, uh, dorsal ventral uh, motion, which would be the uh, vertical displacement, you see actually that the whole system is living in just a, a very, very small space. So uh, what you have here in the moving frame of reference is a system that's basically antiphase. So that entire very high dimensional system is living in this very low dimensional subspace of its dynamics, which will persist as long as this task persists. Of course, the jockey jumps off or gets thrown off, then it's a different game entirely. Yeah? But the interesting thing is these uh, authors, I think they've even patented this uh, uh, we, the jockey uncouples himself from the horse. But in this language, as I've just shown you, actually, our measure of coupling has to do with the temporal phasing relationship between the components. And this is exquisite. This is a very nice example, in my view, of uh, low dimensional dynamics. Now, I, uh, how are we doing on time? Like 10? So uh, the way we uh, <coughs> do this, all the various experiments uh, collapse into this kind of basic uh, mathematical description, where you're going to look at the relative phase relation and its derivative over time as a function of uh, what we call the symmetry breaking. But the delta omega refers to different intrinsic frequencies between the components. Then there's a coupling function that couples the components. So here are your individuals, here's your coupling, and you can also treat the fluctuations, which is in this way is just the simplest form. But actually, uh, many experiments have actually shown that this is not necessarily the, the structure of the fluctuations. The fluctuations can have long memory and so on. But the way to see the dynamics, and I'll show you this visually uh, uh, with uh, uh, simulations in a moment, just to understand this, you're looking here for the fixed points of this kind of dynamics. The fixed points are telling you what the coordinated states of affairs are. And you see in this case, where the slope is negative going through zero, the black dots, there's a fixed point near in phase and a fixed point near antiphase. And this system is what would be called bistable or multistable. Same parameter values, uh, bistability. The open circles are where the slope is not positive, and that's a repelling function. So there's no stability here. There's only stability where there's an attractive force to, uh, uh, with a negative slope uh, towards zero. Here you see uh, the system can produce, for given values of the coupling, two states. Then here's your transition mechanism. Uh, as you change the coupling, which would correspond, for example, in the experiments to some rate manipulation, or uh, you could even think of other kinds of manipulations at other levels, what happens is that the antiphase state, the less stable antiphase state, you know the stability by virtue of the slope of this function, disappears off the line, and it leaves you then only with the in-phase state. And then, actually, there's a further aspect where you have Actually, no states at all, no fixed points. You know, uh, you might remember the beautiful mind of Nash and so on. Nash is very famous for his fixed point theorems. Here, there, there's no fixed points at all, but all you see are tendency towards where the ghosts of the fixed points were, where the fixed points used to be. And this is a tendency to coordinate, a tendency to escape for the components to escape. Yeah. So this. Uh, you know, don't get caught up on the word here. Here we have coordinated states of affairs. They're at least bistable. In this simple case, they're bistable, but they can be multistable. Under parametric control, you have switching decision making. You went from having two possibilities to one possibility. Of course, you can go the other way as well. And here, actually, no states at all, only tendencies. Yeah? And the tendencies are to where the coordinated states used to be. 
uh, and they reveal something really essential about the nature of the relationship between the coordinative aspect, the coupling aspect, and the uh, delta omega. Let me show it dynamically, and I think you can get the picture. Uh, I'll just go through that. So, I should have a little movie here. Yeah. So, there's only two uh, factors really involved here. So here we start off, and all we do is vary the coupling. Okay? We fix the frequency difference between the elements. We vary the coupling. Watch what happens. The stable and the unstable fixed point kiss each other, and they're gone. Now we've had the decision made. This is the only stable state left in the system. But if we uh, uh, keep varying the coupling with the fixed frequency ratio, we see actually no states at all but only tendencies to where they were. Yeah? So this is the creation and annihilation of states of coordination. And of course, they, now they're created again if you reverse it. Now I uh, fix the coupling and vary the intrinsic differences between the components. There's the antiphase state gone. Again, the kissing, the coalescing, and the saddle node bifurcation between the stable and the unstable. It's gone. The only stable state left for the system to uh, explore is the in-phase state. And even that, if you keep making the uh, differences between the components greater, you can imagine all kinds of manipulations that can do that. Actually, this lifts off the line as well. And you then only have uh, tendencies to coordinate to where the fixed points used to be. So uh, you can do this in three dimensions and so on very nicely. This kind of coalescence of uh, uh, coordinated states, stable and unstable coordinated states. And you can see that as you uh, warp this, actually there's a whole region out here that's metastable where there's no coordinated states at all, just tendencies. So this already gives you, I think, a hint of what's going on where you have under certain parameter values coordinated states of affairs, you have transitions and switching and so on, and then uh, actually this large regime where actually uh, you have no coordination and you have a great deal of coordination. Uh, this is the way it looks in time, so you remember some of the examples I gave you. These are uh, uh, no coordination at all, what we might call segregation or uncoupled uh, states of affairs. This would be the integrated state of affairs where you've got a strong coupling and you can see that the, the dynamics go to coordinated states. And then this is this metastable regime where the system holds, releases, holds, releases, holds, releases. Uh, and how long it stays near the uh, coordinated states is a function of how close it is to them. So here you see this wonderful combination of segregation, which means the components do their own thing, and coordination, which means that the components are coupled, and you have actually the subtle blend of both. Yeah. <coughs> Incredible. Yeah. And all of this falls out of this very elementary uh, coordination dynamics. Just to show you this uh, as a visual picture, these colors are just six different initial conditions. And you can see there's no relationship at all. The phase is wrapping. There's no coordination. The staff member of the show excursions team on the beer. They're just the relative to the difference between the components. You're just increasing the coupling. You see the dwell near coordination states is, is going to increase at the same time as you have escapes. It's a dwell escape uh, dynamic. And then, of course, if you make the system really strongly coupled, the system will get into fixed points, and mathematically, it'll be there forever. <coughs> Let's just switch it the other way around. Here we start off, the system's already coordinated. Now I just make the components a little bit different. And uh, watch what happens. <coughs> you, you see, actually, this, this raising of the fixed points, it means the system's adapting. It's adjusting to the uh, frequency difference. 
but it, it, only up to a point, and then we'll lose it. There it escapes, you see? So now, the dynamics here, this is this partial coordination that we talked about. The dynamics here now just have uh, a tendency to dwell and the tendency of the components to do their own thing. So you've got a collective individual, individual collective dynamic here. And of course, where you live in this parameter space, the old message that still is just beginning, I think, to seep into neuroscience. It means uh, you've got to explore your parameter spaces. I've talked to my students about this so that you can see the entire layout of uh, states of affairs and where you live in parameter space is going to determine what you see. And so uh, let me just uh, now in, in the last uh, few minutes extend this slightly. Uh, this is just a recent paper where people have been identifying Popa Pescu, is that uh, from Rutgers? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Rory, can, you, can, you can tell people about this better. But they, uh, they identify uh, different networks in uh, cats, I believe, and they connect then the gamma power to uh, resting state in fMR and so on. And they can actually show that the, the, the gamma power is, uh, anti they call it anti-correlated with these sub-networks. But it already, as you can see, if you look at this dynamic, it doesn't look uh, anti-correlated. It looks more metastable. Um, here's our own data from, in fact, a study of social coordination. Here's the famous mu uh, uh, rhythm, which comes in around 10 hertz. You can see the phi is slightly higher frequency. When you look at this in, in space and time, actually, you see that uh, the mu phi dynamic the coupling of uh, the, the somatosensory rhythm and the coupling of the social rhythm actually have this uh, dwell escape dynamic. Here's the sort of theoretical picture. Here's we're just beginning to quantify this uh, with experiments and so on. Uh, how do we extend this uh, dynamical picture into space where we would have an array of sensors? Can we generalize the principle of uh, metastable coordination dynamics to both space and time. So here would be a typical sensor array. Now can we see this uh, same kind of dynamic in a, uh, uh, a spatial array? This is really, you know, a lot of people have said, well, this dynamical stuff is, is all very well, but how do you handle a spatially extended system here like the brain? And of course, there's been uh, some work on that, but here's, here's the intuition, and I always go to the, about the simplest experiment I can imagine to try to reveal a concept. And this actually is an experiment where people are doing bimanual coordination, there's also brain signals and so on, but they're coordinating with the external stimulus, and the interesting thing is the, the, the relative phase, sorry it's a little bit uh, junky, but the relative phase is uh, stationary over the, between the hands, between the, the between hand synchrony is stable, but the synchrony between the hand and the environment, the organism and the environment here, is not. It's wrapping. So you see, you've got uh, within coordination, and uh, which is uh, uh, nicely coordinated, but the between coordination is not. So is there anything that we know that would be like that? Well. There's uh, some history to this that I don't really have time to go into, but uh, this is a spatial array of oscillators, and it doesn't seem to matter what kinds of oscillator you have, whether it's a kind of Petunia Gomo uh, equation or whatever. But uh, this is a particular uh, uh, simulation where what you see is that there are tendencies for the oscillators to couple at the same time as the oscillators are doing their own thing. So this is in space now. Space is being uh, quantified between 0 and 256. So you have an array here, actually on a ring. Right? So you see this, I mean, Kuramoto, uh, the Japanese dynamicist, uh, found this and actually gave it at a, a festschrift for Hermann Hagen some years ago. And uh, Abrams and Strogatz have uh, re rediscovered it. They have an equation that they can simulate and so on. But the key point for us here is uh, this one that I've 
quoted at the top. What was so odd about the coexistence state is that two seemingly incompatible forms of behavior, locking and uh, incoherence, were present in the same system at the same time. Now, this is now in space. You know? And this is the way it looks when you uh, simulate that. So space is now on the ordinate. And this is the phase of the oscillators. And this is just its temporal uh, evolution. In this case, the oscillators are identical. The key thing, in contrast to many of the theoretical models of brain function and neural networks, the key thing in, in here is that the coupling is non-local. It's not globally coupled. Not everything is coupled to everything else. Nor is it locally coupled, where nearest neighbors are coupled to each other. This is a non-local coupling that produces this wonderful effect of uh, uh, coexistence of uh, coherent states with incoherent states. It's like a new kind of matter. And here's the chimera story. Uh, although I'm not, there's a threeness to this that I don't like, but the famous uh, Greek creature with the body of a goat, the head of a lion, and the, 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 the tail of the serpent. Well, when you uh, track this through, let me show you the trajectories in time of that. And uh, just to show you that actually this is spatial-temporal uh, metastability. And this is not part of their analysis. Uh, here are a group of 64 or 65 oscillators in a ring. And these ones uh, at the bottom are like the solid coordinated ones that you saw before. And these are the other oscillators that have that uh, uh, have different characteristics. They are faster than the, than the base ones. And what you see is that they just hold, release, hold, release, and uh, the dwell times are, are, are variable, right? So this is the spatial-temporal picture of uh, metastability. And uh, when you look at brain, Of course, I call this the snake. Uh, here's your array, and there's no attempt here to do source reconstruction or anything like that. But again, you can see a whole bunch of the uh, elements here, evolving in time, have this coherent and then incoherent dynamic going on uh, at the same time. You know? This is one fixed set of parameters. and. Uh, you can see that very nicely in uh, this kind of bold plot where this is the relative phase at different frequencies. You see this clustering of the oscillators and the scape of the oscillators going on and this, uh, in this time series of this uh, brain. You see they're clustering together, then some will escape, cluster together, some will escape. And I would say the brain needs that, big time. Same kind of thing. You can Emmanuel will talk perhaps a little bit more about how these uh, ensembles are uh, calculated. But uh, here are uh, a, a set of three that are synergized. They're coordinated as a group. They hold together. Here are other ensembles. These are eight altogether out of the entire array. And they go at different frequencies. So you see this packing, uh, packing together and separating uh, as a function of uh, presumably uh, what people are doing. And just I uh, wanted to show you the, that the assembly is metastable, that is coherent and incoherent at the same time. This is the full Monty. Uh, that's for Susan, the full Monty. The dance of these assemblies is coherent and incoherent. And of course, this is all uh, new, and we are getting our hands on this. The picture that uh, I can leave you with is uh, not dissimilar to Emmanuel's uh, uh, opening slide, where you have independent segregated phenomena. All neural groups are functioning independently. And integrated, all neural groups function together. So this is your classical dichotomy between segregation and integration. Then uh, you have some together and some independently. You can see 
actually this is where the information is created and even better uh, you have independent and uh, together at the same time this coexistence effect in this uh, spatial temporal array of oscillators so coordination dynamics theoretical empirical framework for brain coordination and its breakdown two factors the coupling strength for example that can map onto synaptic connectivity uh, it has to be non-local intrinsic uh, component differences between the ensemble the brain is metastable the tendency to integrate phase gather coexists with the tendency to segregate uh, phase scatter at the same time we can talk about why that is and the reasons for it just leave, let me leave you with uh, this at the end oops I, I jumped ahead once uh, so uh, here are uh, trajectories from recorded brain sites. Again, this is this is just a, a, an image to leave you with, where you have this multi-stable regime where you have two possibilities. This is the either or. This is bipolarity. I can either be here or I can be there, and under some conditions, I can switch from being here to there, right? This would be your transition uh, instability mechanism for decision making. Yeah? Uh, but here's the very interesting case where, with respect to what we understand in terms of states, there are no longer any states at all, but there are only tendencies to where the states were. So you have a tendency to integrate and a tendency to segregate uh, coexisting with each other. So you have this coexistence phenomena. Uh, the, this is the metastability effect. And you can see that you could say the brain is integrated or segregated. Uh, under these conditions, it's just segregated. But here, it's actually neither fully integrated and it's neither fully segregated. It's neither fully coordinated and it's, near, it, it's neither uh, uh, fully independent. Both tendencies coexist at the same time. And let me uh, leave you with. Uh, my, uh, one of my uh, uh, heroes, uh, this is Mr. Bohr, uh, who of course uh, gave us the complementarity principle in physics, uh, and uh, you know, is light a wave or a particle? Well, actually it's both, it depends on how you measure it and so on. Uh, this is Bohr's uh, coat of arms, and as you can see it's very interesting, it has the the yin-yang symbol on it. But here's Bohr. If you hold opposites together in your mind, you will suspend your normal thinking process and allow an intelligent beyond rational thought to create a new form. Yeah. And uh, it used to be thought, just may, maybe make a, a small comment there, that, uh, that life, for example, would not be conceived of as complementarity, as a, an example of complementarity. And uh, it used to be thought that life really, uh, since the double helix, life is only about DNA. Uh, and that's a very nice, clean story. But of course, life is not only about DNA. Life is about at least DNA and metabolism. Metabolism is much messier. So the image here, again, uh, is the brain can be synchronized. But the coordination is messier. And the messier coordination has to do with coexisting tendencies. And I would invite us to take uh, complementarity very seriously indeed because as far as uh, you know, I would uh, share with you, I think it uh, holds uh, an element of, uh, a key element of truth that you need to take into account uh, both aspects at the same time. Okay? And so it's neither one nor the other, it can be, uh, but uh, the enlightenment is seeing the, the complementarity. Thank you very much. That's very nice. So one way to proceed is to understand the relationship between brain oscillators. And uh, you made a couple of comments on it, and I'd like to make a couple of comments as well. Yes, uh, Traditionally, we, well, we don't know how many different types of oscillators there are in the brain. What we know is that how our predecessors divided brain frequencies artificially. Yes. And we have a tendency of taking them seriously and uh, look at the ratio and the process of 
things between them and we can come up with an M relationship and, and Arnold's tongues and this sort of things. But if you look at the real oscillators, the ones that are identified and that we, we know this is a particular type of oscillators, how they couple, yeah. they, the, the only relationship is a non-integer relationship. And maybe this is by design. The only way how cross frequency coupling happens in our hands is always that the slower phase modulates the power of the faster. That's yes. a rule. That's, yes. a, that's an overriding that's rule in the brain. Yes. But I have never seen phase coupling between different oscillators other than transient. Yes. And I'd like to su Thank you suggest that, that this is in fact the, the fundamental <coughs> basis of metastability in the brain Thank you very because much. of the non integer relationship. Thank you very much. Actually, the, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Busaki is saying there, that uh, uh, these idealized uh, frequency couplings, two to one, actually these are the Arnold tongues, but uh, the space between the Arnold tongues uh, is the metastability, and that's where you are living, that's where the brain is living, when you really look at these oscillations. The closer you are to the tongues, however, the longer you will dwell in an apparent NM relationship. Uh, so uh, these aspects have not come out as far as I can see in studies of cross-frequency coupling so far. So, uh, the, a nice quote from Bohr also, he said to a student once, um, you're not thinking, you're just being logical. Yeah. Um, anyway, the, I have two questions. Thank you very much for a really fascinating talk, um, both involving the chemical link. Yes. Um, one is the coordination, which is increasingly fascinating me, between the central nervous system with the endocrine system and the immune system, which is a kind of halfway house between the environment and the neurons, yeah. uh, which I think really does need signaling molecules in order to be trilingual, and therefore you have to invent some sort of chemical link, not just a biophysical one. Um, and uh, also the fact that you can shift from a quantitative phenomena, let's say you can shift from tonic to phasic firing, yeah. and that can actually bring about a qualitative change, that is to say suddenly the co-release of a peptide with the transmitter rather than just the transmitter. So you're suddenly having quantitative translated into qualitative. And really they're just two thoughts um, from my own stance as a neurochemist, put in a bid for neurochemistry Excellent. as being important Excellent. in both the high level ways you're talking but also in the sort of nuts and bolts of things. Yes, yes, um, thank you for that. Um, the, uh, the tonic phasic distinction that would be brought about by neurochemical changes in the, most, in the more abstract picture here would be kind of equivalent to what I was talking about, segregation and integration. Yeah. That these are not, these are two modes of coordination, but actually there may actually be very subtle blends if we had the right parametric studies, uh, for instance, of what the level of neurohormones were and so on. But uh, uh, this is, I think, a very nice aspect of uh, having you here because we can bring the chemistry into this in an interesting way. Sorry, I went a little bit over time, but that is the first time I've really done this. The first time? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, the first, you know, some parts are his day, and not that the, this, uh, it's the part. <laughs> Scott, so I have a question, because it seems that historically, you introduced a phase transition to a number of people, yeah. but because of uh, just a coincidence, your transitions consist of changes in phase. Yes. I remember your <laughs> yes. first paper clarifying Yes. Which phase yes. transition you're talking about? Can you elaborate a little bit? Are you talking about phase transitions? Yes. You talk about changes in the phases of yes. the phase? Yes. Can you yes. Very, yes. very, very straightforward. Uh, the the quantity that exhibits the qualitative change is the relative phase. So it happens to be a, a coincidence here that the qualitative change would would be in the thermodynamics be a phase transition, a qualitative change in the uh, state of matter, for instance. In, in this dynamical sense, in this non-equilibrium system, is characterized in this case by a relative phase that's telling you about the coordination among the elements. Yeah? So a phase transition happens to be also in the space of relative phase in this circumstance. There are other order parameters, of course, yeah. In the dynamical case, you can use word bifurcation. Yeah, in the dynamical case, we would use the word bifurcation. I like tying this a little bit more into the physics because you're tracking the fluctuations, you're 
doing experiments that will perturb the system and see how it relaxes and so on. But of course, uh, from the dynamical picture I showed you with the broken symmetry case, then you have a saddle node bifurcation. In the straight case where you don't have independent, you know, a, a component for the uh, frequencies, it's uh, basically a, uh, well, a two-dimensional hop for a, a, what's the pitchfork, you know? pitchfork in one dimension. But phase transitions, bifurcations, uh, common language for mathematicians.